Okay, we're now going to resume. Thank you for your patience as we attempted to try through the staff, through our own staff, to work out uh, an adjustment to Commissioner Adler's amendment. I'm going to recognize Commissioner Adler now. Commissioner Adler. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I want to thank my colleagues for uh, bearing with me as we attempt to move towards a resolution of this and to develop a stronger consensus. So what I'm going to do is withdraw the original motion and provide a substitute a motion, and the critical words that are different are the words that say that we have directed staff to develop a protocol subject to commission approval prior to the commission consideration of the 2017 mid-year review for developing an appropriate protocol and for uh, assessing the appropriate procedures to follow uh, in implementing this as a program. So uh, with that, I move the amended motion and seek a second. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we'll now turn to discussion. But Commissioner Adler, do you want, I understand you might want some time, and I'm happy to yield it to you to further explain uh, your thought behind this amendment. Yeah, I was caught a little short when you when I put my motion in, and usually we get, then get to explain the motion, but then you sort of moved on, and I didn't get a chance to read a few remarks that explain why I think this is so important. Uh, I think we all know that voluntary standards have in gained increasing importance in CPSC activities over the past 30-plus years. This has resulted in part uh, because of legal changes to the Consumer Product Safety Act that direct us to give preference to voluntary standards over mandatory standards under certain conditions. It's also occurred because we've been directed to build mandatory standards for certain children's products on a framework of voluntary standards. Uh, and perhaps as important, if not more so, it's occurred because the agency and the voluntary standards community have increased our cooperation and collaboration with each other. And I say this as an observer of the product safety scene for over 40 years. I think relations between CPSC and the voluntary standards community have never been better. Uh, that said, they can still be dramatically improved. And I want to point out, as I did before, one glaring shortfall in the voluntary standards process that folks in the voluntary standards community see as clearly as we do, and that is the lack of meaningful consumer input in far too many voluntary standards proceedings. And the reason is simple. Unlike industry participants, consumers and consumer groups, for the most part, don't have the resources to participate in such proceedings, nor do they have the same access to technical information that would enable them to engage at the same level as industry participants. And here's the critical point. The result is too often voluntary standards are developed that don't provide a full measure of safety to adequately protect consumers, and that's the point of this uh, um, amendment. I've had numerous conversations with friends in the voluntary standards community, and as I say, a lot of them share this concern. To address this imbalance, some standards development organizations have begun providing limited funding for travel and other expenses to consumers, and I particularly want to acknowledge the efforts of ASTM, ANSI, and UL in this regard. Their efforts have helped but not solved the problem. There are still too many standards development organizations, and including a number that want to work with CPSC in developing voluntary standards that fail to provide any support whatsoever to consumers, and NFPA was cited as one of the examples, the Portable Gas uh, Manufacturers Association, uh, the Window Covering Manufacturers Association. None of these provide any resources uh, in support of consumer involvement in their standards development proceedings. My amendment seeks to have CPSC establish a uh, program to provide resources for technical and other supports to consumers and consumer organizations for voluntary standards that are important to the agency. Uh, and I'm not going to read this next point because it's been mooted by comments that uh, Commissioner Mohorovic made, but I did want to make one final point again. Uh, we've had a regulation on participation in voluntary standards that's been on the book for many decades, which gives the Commission the authority to provide funding support for voluntary standards development. It's never been implemented in the years since its adoption. But given our increased and increasing involvement in, standard in voluntary standards development, 
I think the type is, time is ripe for us to help ensure that more balance is added to these efforts. Thank you, Commissioner Ather, and thank you for your flexibility uh, in terms of your amendment and also to the other commissioners for uh, trying to find a path forward. I think that we'll get there, and I appreciate that we were able to, or hopefully that we're able to do that. I plan to support the, uh, new, mo the new amendment that you've introduced. Commissioner Robinson. Any further? Commissioner Burkle. I have nothing further. Thank you. I do uh, just want to express my appreciation to the chairman and to Commissioner Adler for um, taking a step back and, and coming out up with this amendment. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to appreciate Commissioner Adler for his reconsideration, his uh, friendly amendment to his amendment to give us a better idea of what potentially we're about to uh, to vote on in the future with regards to reallocation of our allocated of our funds. I would like to point out that there is a very important stakeholder who will have the opportunity to consider what we're what we're attempting to do with our appropriated dollars, and that is Congress, who have not voted for it, voted. Uh, in final, our FY17 appropriation, but only a continuing resolution to fund us through the end of the year. So they'll have the full opportunity to consider whether or not uh, they want to send us additional language uh, uh, to uh, encourage us or potentially discourage us from reallocating appropriated resources or to inquire whether or not we should put a particular amended line item in our requested funds to identify how much we plan on uh, sending outside of the CPSC to uh, private parties. I have no further comments, Commissioner Adler. Well, that certainly, uh, Commissioner Mohorovic's remarks certainly don't sound like f uh, a friendly disposition towards this approach. If anything, it sounds like uh, uh, we can expect uh, a phone call or a visit to the Hill on his part, and I would just urge him to at least until we've come up with a specific approach here, maybe to withhold uh, that approach and see what the staff comes up and s with and see whether he agrees with it. Commissioner Robinson. Further? No. Commissioner Burkle, anything further? Nothing further. Commissioner Mohorovic, anything nothing further? further? Having heard nothing further on the Adler Amendment, we'll now take the vote. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Burkle? Aye. Commissioner Mohorovic? Aye. And I vote aye. The yeas are five, the nays are zero. The Adler Amendment has been approved. Are there any further amendments? I have one, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Robinson? I am asking that we amend the operation plan um, to add on page 7 under other planned voluntary standards activities um, the non-integral firearm locking devices and youth resistant firearm security containers. When I first came to the Commission, I asked about why we weren't doing more to make guns safer and I was initially told, please do not mention the word gun. Um, and I did not for a long time. And I fully appreciate that the CPSC has explicitly been told by Congress that we do not have jurisdiction over guns or ammunition. However, we do have jurisdiction over two small but critically important areas involving gun safety. And I have to think particularly child safety drove those exceptions. Gun locks that are added to guns after manufacture to prevent it from being fired unless the locking device is removed and gun safes, which are a secure and protective storage container for firearms, are the two exceptions when it comes to guns. So although we cannot do much to make guns safer, I believe we should do all that we can to make them as safe as possible. And I would like to thank Ted Alcorn, who is the research director at Every Town for Gun Safety, who presented testimony at our priorities hearing and that left, led to an ongoing conversation with him over the past months and he introduced us to a number of key people in the field doing amazing research and work on ways that we can encourage more people both to use guns, locks and safes and uh, making sure that they're working properly but also he um, w introduced us to people who are doing some very exciting work in the area of gun locks and safes um, and some of the uh, technology that they're introducing. Um, in 2001, the CPSC tested 32 models of gun locks and because I'm going to be talking about data in a moment, I would just like to emphasize here that there, there were not and I can't fathom how there will be data on gun locks being safe. But there was, there were no data at that time, but we took 32 models of gun locks and 30 of them failed our tests. 
This prompted a series of recalls and gun locks were distributed as part of a national safety education and outreach effort. And in 2004, ASTM passed a voluntary standard both with respect to gun locks and gun safes. Now, while those um, standards were reaffirmed in 2009 and 10 and 2016, there was absolutely nothing that went into that process, according to ASTM, other than merely polling the members of the committee. So there was no consideration of anything substantive with respect to those standards. Um, the gun lock standard for ASTM is F236904. Um, and then 2016, obviously, and it's a standard safety specifications for non-integral firearm locking devices. And this standard appears to contemplate only locks using a key or a mechanical combination lock. It doesn't allow for gun locks using electronic locks or locks using biometric or Wi-Fi technology. And the gun safe standard, again, passed in 2004, um, is for lockable containers that completely contain firearms um, and again just has the technology that was in place in 2004. Now as I mentioned, I don't think we're going to ever have the data that we need to support whether gun locks work. I'm having trouble thinking that any emergency room um, employee is going to put in the narrative that we look at in our NICE data that a child um, was shot or somebody was shot by a child um, because the, got the trigger lock did, failed. But here's what we do know. We do know that in the 12 years since the standard was examined substantively and passed, there have been huge improvements that have ta taken place with respect to technology. And we also know the horrifying statistics that there are more than 2 million American children living in homes with guns that are not stored safely or securely, and each of those children has friends who visit those homes. Less than 15 percent of the gun-owning households report storing their firearms unlocked and loaded, um, and those households account for more than two-thirds of unintentional child shootings. And that's where my focus is. To date, during this year alone, we've had 199 children as of two days ago who have unintentionally killed or injured someone with a gun, and I was just told by Dottie Yar that as of this morning, two days later, we can increase that by four. It's up to 203 in 2016. I've spoken with people at the Harvard School of Public Health that are using the National Violence Violent Death R Reporting System, examining unintentional firearm deaths involving children, and they looked at 16 states um, between 2005 and 2012, and they found that above deaths, not injuries, just deaths, that 229 um, of the unintentional firearm deaths of children were between 0 and 14 in those 16 states. And then as they looked at the way in which the, the, uh, the incidents were classified, many of the deaths by, that were caused by children with access to guns um, were labeled homicide, so they were not captured in the data. And when they moved that to unintentional, which was the correct classification, the number was 80 percent higher. Um, in recognizing the limitations of that study, the researchers pointed to the brevity of the narratives, which did not provide enough qualitative data. Researchers noted that the vast majority of deaths appeared to occur when a child found a gun in the home that was improperly stored. However, the narratives did not provide information on how that happened, whether the gun lock and storage lock um, failed or the, if the gun was not properly um, locked or stored. Um, there have been several studies with respect to suicides, and I certainly appreciate that that is outside of CPSC's jurisdiction. Um, however, the, while these studies have focused on suicide attempts, the results show that keeping guns locked properly, unloaded, and safely stored um, results in a significant decrease, particularly uh, in firearm injuries and deaths, particularly with children and teenagers. So the, while studies show that certainly guns safely stored and locked um, bring about a reduction in firearm-related incidents, including injuries and deaths, especially among children, 
Um, and we, what we need to make sure of is that if adults are engaging in responsible firearm storage and locking, that those devices work properly. At this point, um, what I'm asking is that we allocate uh, some CPSC resources to try to, to ascertain whether the standards passed 12 years ago, um, which is a lifetime ago when it comes to technology, um, are what should be in place in 2016 in terms of actually making gun locks and gun safes safe um, so that we can hopefully drive down these numbers of unintentional deaths of our children. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, uh, we'll now turn to discussion of the Robinson Amendment. Uh, I want to commend Commissioner Robinson for this amendment, which I plan to support. Uh, it we're almost four years on Sa the anniversary of Sandy Hook, and after that occurred, Vice President Biden reached out to a number of agencies to see what could be done through the White House and through other agencies to try to certainly tackle at a holistic level gun violence. As you mentioned, CPSC has a very small part in that, and that was the area that Vice President Biden discussed with my predecessor, Chairman Tenenbaum, which was trying to see if the gun lock and gun safe voluntary standards could be enhanced. Chairman Tenenbaum did get the CPSC engaged. Staff did start to engage on the voluntary standards bodies. I think that, uh, and I hope it's changed, the frustration that I certainly felt was that there was a lack of technical expertise to try to bridge the gaps that folks recognized in the substandard aspect of these standards to try to have better product. I did end up visiting with a couple of individuals out in South Dakota who had demonstrated pretty handily how easy it is to defeat these. So I think you're on to a real safety issue. The question is whether between our staff or somebody on the outside, will the right parties come to the table with the right knowledge to give the subcommittee something to work with? I have Len Morrissey in particular of ASTM has gone way above and beyond to try to drive uh, groups to the table to want to improve these standards and certainly the participants in the normal rounds were ready, willing, and able to consider something that was balloted. We just didn't have anybody step forward who had concrete suggestions to enhance the standards. So while I am thrilled to support the amendment, I do hope that somebody steps forward so that something can be made of it and I'm happy to yield if you want to address that particular point. Uh, yes, I would love to. I also spoke with Len Morrissey who expressed uh, uh, being very open to reopening the standard, but I, I have also spoken with individuals who would very much like to participate in such a standard um, uh, standards committee and have um, a great deal of technological expertise and have come up with some really quite fabulous um, improvements uh, in, since 2000, since four years ago. So um, it, I'm very excited about those people's participation in this, and I think it could be very, it could really enhance safety. I, I think that's fantastic, and thank you for doing that legwork to try to draw, drum up that business for it. I, as we've discussed on other occasions, from my perspective at least, the final step would be to not only have ASTM improve their standards, but to have California, we're back to talking about California, to have California amend their lock and uh, safe standards or at least adopt what ASTM has done so that similar as we see on upholster furniture, it does seem that California drives the market and obviously whatever my office can assist with, we're happy to continue to do that. I appreciate that. Commissioner Adler. Um, I, I support Commissioner Robinson's amendment. Uh, as I've listened to her explain it, I've gained uh, a degree of reassurance that this is a very carefully honed uh, amendment. Um, but I, uh, somebody who uh, has lived through the trauma of the agency's consideration of anything relating to guns or bullets, I did want to just uh, express a word of caution. But I, I need to preface what I'm going to say by uh, making certain that I put on record that I am somebody who strongly dislikes guns. I think one of the worst decisions the United States Supreme Court ever made was when it handed down the Heller case that found a constitutional right for individuals to keep and bear arms for self-defense. Uh, I think the statistics, as Commissioner Robinson said, are 
clear in one respect. Contrary to the arguments made by gun advocates, the data against guns are overwhelming and clear. Uh, for every criminal that's killed in self-defense, 34 innocent people die from the irresponsible use of guns. So my concern is not with trying to reduce gun hazards. My concern is uh, you have the m message in the medium, and I'm just not sure we're the proper medium for doing much beyond what Commissioner Robinson is proposing. Uh, and I would just take us all back in history in 1974. We were petitioned by a citizens group to ban bullets as hazardous substances under the FHSA, which is interesting because F uh, FDA, which was the previous enforcing body, had always exercised jurisdiction over bullets. They never tried to ban them. They never tried to regulate uh, the intended use of bullets, but they said if a bullet uh, unexpectedly explodes or unexpectedly triggers, uh, that creates a hazard to folks, and uh, FDA uh, f reserved the right to exercise jurisdiction over defective bullets. Um, so when it came to us as a uh, successor agency, um, we admitted we had jurisdiction, but the commission, by a four-to-one vote, and I will point out my boss, David Piddle, was the dissenter, they denied any right to regulate properly functioning bullets. Uh, Commissioner Piddle said, let's at least explore the uh, petition. We were sued because of this decision, and the district court said, no, you're wrong. You have to fully consider the petition on its merits. And here's my concern. There was a firestorm of protest. We got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of comments within weeks of the judge's ruling. We sort of ground to a halt, to be honest. We actually had to hire staff just to open all of the letters that came in. And we had one staff person whose job was to put the death threats separate from the rest of the comments that came in. Uh, but before we could fully address the petition, Congress, in its full majesty, and they can act quickly when they want to, stepped in and removed any and all jurisdiction over bullets from the agency. So here's my concern. At the end of the process, consumers were actually worse off than when the petition was filed because we no longer had any ability to seek recalls of defective ammunition. We spent lots of very scarce, precious dollars and staff months on bullets that I would have preferred to see devoted to other hazardous products. So we ran headfirst into the doctrine of unintended consequences. So in short, as much as I would love to see a strong federal response to control and regulate the irresponsible use of guns, I don't think we have the staff or the dollars to get in any in-depth approach to addressing this. So that's why I'm fine with uh, Commissioner Robinson's amendment. I just want to express at this point one uh, note of caution. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to commend my uh, colleague, Commissioner Robinson, and all of her work uh, that she's done on this issue. I don't have any questions this morning. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorova. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any uh, questions for Commissioner Robinson with regards to her, to her amendment. Uh, but I would like to comment uh, that along with every responsible gun owner, I certainly share Commissioner, Commissioner Robinson's concern about kids getting unsupervised access to guns. The outcomes, as we've seen far too often, are beyond tragic. However, I have not seen the data to suggest that failure of gun locks or gun safes is driving those terrible outcomes. If that data existed and our staff agreed with the credibility of that evidence, I'm left wondering why our staff was not compelled to recommend participating in the voluntary standards Commissioner Robinson recommends we direct staff resources towards. So in the absence of that kind of information, I cannot make a decision on whether or not it is an appropriate use of agency resources to redirect and involve our staff in those voluntary standards at the exclusion of others where there may be a more clearly demonstrated need. So for those reasons, uh, I cannot support Commissioner Robinson's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorova. Commissioner Robinson. I would just like to quickly respond, first of all, to Commissioner Adler's um, comments, and I am, I certainly didn't live through it, but I've heard the horror stories about bullets. Um, I'm not for a moment suggesting that we're expanding jurisdiction here. 
but rather making sure we're uh, making safe those limited things that are within our jurisdiction. And um, I, I, I share with you the the sort of, um, I, I, I don't know the, the exact word I want to use, but my Swedish son-in-law sent me an email a while back um, about, my, about the state of Utah where I have a vacation home. And the subject line was, things about your country I will never understand. And it was an article about the state of Utah um, deciding to have a state gun, not a state flower, not a state bird, but a state gun. And we have one there. But <laughs> that's just an aside. But let me just say, with respect to the data, Commissioner Mohorovic, yes, I would love to have data one way or the other. Again, I've circled this many, many times. I cannot imagine where that data will come from. Um, we certainly had none when we tested 32 guns and 32 of the locks on those guns failed. We just have done nothing like that in 12 years, um, well, longer than that, 15 years, um, in terms of deciding whether um, this standard is, is what it should be. But what we do know is it hasn't in any way incorporated any of the new technology. And the resources that will be committed to it, I'm told by Dr. Borlase, will be quite limited at this point. And then we can decide once, we, once the evaluation takes place um, as to what we want to do with it from there. But at this point, he's saying that it'll, it'll just be one staff month and that it'll come from the unplanned hazard work. So I don't feel like we are ignoring other things um, to evaluate this standard to see what we can do about these hundreds of deaths every year. The only remaining comments I want to make, I do want to reiterate my strong support for the amendment. And I would like to just attempt to reassure Commissioner Adler, if possible, only because we just went through this a little less than four years ago, where the agency took the steps, not through an operating plan, but we did engage staff. And staff eventually included in its operating plans going forward for a couple of years the exact type of work that Commissioner Robinson is attempting through her amendment to restore. So I don't see her amendment, and I'm, this is a positive about it from your point of view, I don't see it as breaking new ground. I don't see it as necessarily, no pun intended, triggering any type of response from any outside party because we've already done this. And so I think it's a very prudent step. I think it is consistent with our statutory responsibilities. It is a, uh, it's a relatively small one, as Commissioner Robinson has acknowledged, but an important one to try to do our part. And if we had not gone through what we went through three years ago, where we were able to do this work, it was done in an unemotional environment. We did, thankfully, we did not receive, as far as I'm aware of, mail that would have required more employees and death threats. And that's a good thing that we didn't have that happen. Uh, I'm comforted by that. I might be wrong, but I'm comforted by the fact that this is, this is only returning the agency, if it passes, to doing what the agency had been doing a few years ago. And, and I think it's an appropriate step to take. Commissioner Adler, any further comments? Commissioner Burkle, any further comments? Nothing further, thank you. Commissioner Morovic, Commissioner Robinson? Nothing further. Having heard no further comments on the Robinson Amendment, we'll now call the vote. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Burkle? No. Commissioner Morovic? No. And I vote aye. The yeas are three, the nays are two. The Robinson Amendment has been adopted. Are there any further amendments? All right. Having heard none, we'll now turn to consideration of the underlying operating plan as amended. Uh, is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we will have any final discussion on it, and then I'll call a vote. And again, as a reminder, we'll have closing statements. I have no further discussion before voting. Commissioner Adler. No further. <coughs> excuse me. No further discussion. Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Burkle. Nothing further. Commissioner Mohorovic. No, thank you. Having heard no further discussion on the operating plan as amended, I now call the vote. I move that the agency, that the commission approve the fiscal year 2017 operating plan as amended. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Burkle? No. Commissioner Mohorovic? No. And I vote aye. The yeas are three, the nays are two. The operating plan for fiscal year 2017 as amended, as amended has been adopted. We'll now turn to closing statements, and as usual, the commissioners will have 10 minutes. I do plan to try to use a lot less time than that uh, for many reasons. 
including the fact that we're going to be right back at it pretty soon for a portable generators briefing. And if we use up all our time, I think we might end up just rolling right into that. Uh, I'd, first, I just want to thank the staff. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, you're still here, so thank you for that. Uh, I think that the staff, and certainly starting with our executive director, Patricia Atkins, and her staff, and our Office of Financial Management and EXHR and all the various constituent parts of the agency. It's a huge lift to do this. I know it takes many months. You're probably already starting on the FY18 operating plan process to get the offices ready for it. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it, and there's really a lot of difficult choices. There are so many different ideas that the agency could get involved with, should get involved with, that we have to turn our attention elsewhere at this point because of the very limited, unnecessarily so, funds that we have. I think that the Commission should be funded at a much higher level. I think there are certainly many different projects that are either not in here or even that are in here, like ATVs, that if we had a much higher level of funding, we would be able to resolve those and remove the uncertainty for everybody, industry in particular, with those steps. There is, though, a tremendous amount of great work in this operating plan. And even well beyond the amendments that were adopted today, the core operating plan that staff provided speaks to addressing, or at least moving forward, addressing some critical safety hazards that continue. And I think the Commission has a role to play in it. I'm pleased that staff is always, every year, able to get so much work out of such limited resources. I can only imagine what you could do if we were properly funded. But I commend you for the efforts. I do want to thank my fellow commissioners. A lot of work went into this, even as we took our break, their special assistants, and especially my office, Allison Steinle, Jacqueline Campbell, Jonathan Midget, and Janifong Swamidas for the shuttle diplomacy and the late nights to try to get where we were today. Thank you. Commissioner Adler. Um, I honestly don't think we can thank staff enough. Sometimes this is uh, uh, such incredible amount of work that's gone into the development of an operating plan, and simply saying thank you doesn't somehow convey all of the gratitude that I think we and probably consumers across the land, if they knew what was going into this, would want to extend to you. Uh, I note that there are seven amendments that have been adopted today. Uh, imagine the amount of work that went into each and every one of those. I'm speaking only on behalf of the amendment that uh, I submitted, and you can see the amount of work we did up uh, in front of the, uh, the meeting today and multiply that by about 10 or 20, and you get an idea of how much work the staff has put in, not just on the under line operating plan, but in dealing with all of the individual commissioners' concerns and complaints. So I think it's turned out to be a very good operating plan, uh, no surprise given the quality of the staff that's been working on this. And all I can do once again is commend you for doing an excellent job. And again, I want to thank my fellow commissioners, and uh, I, I think also it's important that we never can thank our individual staff enough. So. I'd like particularly to thank Sarah Klein, uh, Jen Feinberg, and uh, a new addition to our staff who is not here. Right oh, there she is, Maureen Kentoff, so uh, AKA Mo. So if you haven't met Mo yet, she's sitting in the back and she's just a wonderful addition to my office, and I thank all of you. Commissioner Robinson. I, I reiterate um, what I said when you, uh, we had the briefing on this. Thank you so much to staff for the incredible effort that went into this. Um, it was timely. It was descriptive and transparent, and I very much appreciate this effort. I also want to thank um, not only my staff, but the staffs of the other commissioners. I really am impressed with the group of, of personal staffs that we have working together and how thoughtfully they consider um, each other's positions. But obviously, particularly, I want to I want to thank uh, Dottie Yar and Heather Bramble for their work on this. Ha uh, Boaz Green is off with his daughter, seeing his family in Israel, so he did not participate in this. And and uh, but the two of them just did an incredible job, and I really um, am am uh, very grateful for that. I'm delighted at this op plan that we have that we have voted on today, and I'm really excited about the work that we have committed. Um, to doing. As is often the case, we debated a number of amendments here, it, here today, and I just want to thank uh, my fellow commissioners for the thoughtful amendments that they offered, and I was happy to give my, my support. I also thank my fellow commissioners for the support on 
on my amendment. Uh, I, just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we shouldn't do the tiny bit that we can. And I do think that this amendment, small as it was, will will help in in making guns safer. And I look forward to our staff's report on this. Um, and with respect to the amendments um, by by uh, Chairman Kay and Commissioner Adler, I'm very much looking forward to the work that staff is going is going to do on on this front. Um, I. I do have to say that to anybody in Congress who may be listening to this, I hope you look at this op plan. We are never ending lists of projects that are related to consumer product safety that we all would like to do at the CPSC and we'd like to resolve things more quickly, but our reality is we're small and we have very limited resources. But I really hope that Congress looks at this op plan and understands that if we do not receive every dollar that's allocated to this plan, it will be necessary to defer very important safety projects. And deferring those safety projects has real significant and potentially dangerous consequences for industry and consumers alike. I think we've been in the news more than uh, pr practically any other agency recently um, because of dangerous and new products and newsworthy recalls that clearly show um, how, what an excellent job CPSC can do in protecting consumers, but also the need for us to be able to quickly respond um, with technical solutions and innovative ways of ensuring safety. And we need appropriate funding to do that. Um, Heather Bramble was saying to me yesterday that this is her favorite thing that she does here at the agency. We deal with so many um, distinct projects, but the op plan is the macro of what we do here at the agency. And I completely agree with her. And every time we do the op plan, I find myself re-energized with respect to what we do here at the agency. We're three weeks out from a really ugly election. <laughs> the ugliness of the past year, months, weeks, days has been so disheartening and deeply troubling to everyone I know. We find ourselves apologizing constantly to people both in this country and our friends outside of this country for the spectacle that we've made um, of our election cycle this year. Um, and I, it's the first time in my lifetime that I've seen how quickly a great country can become diminished so quickly. Yesterday morning, I found a smile in listening to an NPR piece on some Canadians who put together a video that, if you haven't seen it, you should, to tell us how great we are. I love that someone tweeted that it's always nice to have a kind upstairs neighbor when mom and dad are fighting. Um, and today, we have, we're, I look at what we did today, though, and we have a small but a critically important reminder of what makes this country great. We have an agency comprised of talented, dedicated people. We're fulfilling a public health and safety mission that Congress, um, in its wisdom, assigned to us, in its then wisdom, I probably should say. And looking at the op plan for this agency for this upcoming fiscal year emphasizes the real life consequences that our work has on people's life. And I would just say that I'm grateful and humbled to be a part of the process. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, too, want to echo my colleagues' comments and gratitude um, to the staff for putting together this op plan, uh, partic particularly Patricia, Dwayne Ray, Jay Hoffman, James Baker, and the Office of Financial Management. I recognize how hard and how trying it is to produce an operating plan without the certainty of a full appropriation from Congress. I do appreciate your efforts and the timeliness of this document, despite that that challenge. I also want to thank this morning John McGugan and Kim Dulick for facilitating my participation in this uh, meeting via phone. And thank you to my colleagues and to the entire staff for understanding my need to participate remotely during this time uh, with my mother's illness. I, I do so appreciate, and I just want to make sure everyone understands you the kind thoughts and words that I've received from so many. I just want to let you know how much I appreciate that and what it means to me um, as, a, as a commissioner. So thank you very much. Although the uh, operating plan was provided to us in a timely way, I was unable to support it for a number of reasons. Uh, to begin with, the plan contemplates final rules for the highly controversial voluntary recall notices and the 6B proposals. I'm puzzled at this point what's going to happen with these proposals. 
Uh, many, you are familiar with what happened at the Reg Agenda in the fall, uh, where Commissioner Adler indicated he would offer compromise proposals on both subjects. And while I remain somewhat open to those uh, compromises, I'm unclear as to how such compromises would be acted upon. Would we abandon regular order and ignore the substantial comments from outside stakeholders? The operating plan reflects that this, the staff will transmit final rule packages to the commission in the current fiscal year. Yet staff from all affected offices have informed me in meetings that they have no resources allocated to, to either project. These NPRs should be terminated. We should start over again. But before we do that, uh, and I, I've been opposed to both of these since their inception. But even apart from the content of these proposals, they should be delayed. And during the course of the preparation for today's hearing, uh, I floated some amendments uh, among my colleagues and couldn't get support from the majority that would have moved the NPRs for voluntary recall notices in 60, <clears throat> excuse me, back to DATRs. And I offered those two amendments because we have promised, and I should say the chairman has promised, a public workshop on recall effectiveness. The exchange of information during such a workshop would be relevant to any rule on voluntary recall notices. And similarly, I understand from the Office of OGC that they will be updating our Freedom of Information uh, Act, later, the rules later this year. And so it appears possible that revisions will address and possibly move some of the 6B suggestions. Thus, it would make sense to hold off on both of those the 6B and, uh, and the NPR on voluntary recall notices. Uh, I am disappointed that the uh, majority wouldn't go along and, and support those amendments. But again, I just want to express um, my concern about those two NPRs that remain on our book and in this plan as a final rule. These issues, quite frankly, have become an embarrassing mess to the agency. And it really has been through no fault of the staff. Um, in previous years, the chairman emphasized he did not regard these as priority issues, and now it feels as if they've become more of a priority issue. So I'm sensing a different attitude uh, on, on hit the chairman's part as well as determination on the part of the other commissioners to move this forward. And I truly hope, given the lack of clarity and trans, uh, transparency in this process, that this is not and not going to be midnight rulemaking, but rather a good faith effort at trying to compromise. But I, I do believe that moving them to DATR would have been a more prudent uh, action for both of those NPRs uh, for the commission. Also of concern to me in the ops plan is the tip over ANPR. Um, it was not forecast in our 2017 budget. And quite simply, this ANPR is premature and inappropriate. The staff recently sent us a briefing package on this subject and it does not support moving forward with rulemaking. The existing voluntary standard is barely two years old and there is no evidence whatsoever that the standard is inadequate. I've asked staff explicitly whether they are aware of any deaths or injuries resulting from tip overs of dressers or other clothing storage units that comply with the 14 standard and the answer is no. It's inappropriate to press for improvements to a voluntary standard at this point. We would be far better off helping manufacturers to improve their designs and meet the current voluntary standard rather than moving the goalposts again so soon. On portable generators, the operating plan contemplates the final rule in the current fiscal year. This is another area where I think we should hold off on the rulemaking. Our staff has been working for years on a way to limit carbon monoxide emissions from portable generators. I appreciate their intensive work. We've met with them uh, on a regular basis to learn about their progress and their engagement in this area. Their efforts have spurred a tremendous amount of activity in the private sector. Only recently there has been a breakthrough with the industry promising to open the voluntary standard and address the CO hazard. Some argue that the industry won't move forward until we actually propose a mandatory standard. That argument is contradicted by the industry's recent activities and voluntary standards commitment. Moreover, proposing a standard requires the industry to vote resources and it actually causes them to misdirect their resources on the wrong thing. Instead of focusing on a voluntary standard, they must work to address the staff's proposal. 
In the case of portable generators, there are additional reasons to support voluntary standards in preference to mandatory regulation. There are serious questions about our legal authority to regulate carbon monoxide emissions. And while I will get to those concerns in greater depth in this afternoon's hearing, I will say that if we pursued a voluntary standard, we could alleviate any legal issues that should be, um, that would be a um, strong preference is to, to follow the voluntary standards. Speaking of um, ROVs, uh, I would encourage the staff to save uh, some of their own time, and we've talked about this with the chairman and resources by combining a briefing passage on the voluntary standards with a recommendation to terminate rulemaking if they consider that that's the appropriate outcome. With regards to upholstered furniture, the commission staff has labored for years to try to develop a regulation in this area. In the 16 Ops Plan approved last February, I sponsored an amendment asking for a report on the California standard TB117 and a comparison to our own rulemaking proposal. Staff produced a very significant report with remarkable conclusions, including a recommendation to terminate rulemaking in this area. I think we need to seek public comment on that document and per the chairman's suggestion, uh, that is something that I will pursue and discuss with him uh, as we go forward here and possibly come up with something at mid-year. Uh, just as concerning as what's, not, what's in the OPS plan is what's not in the OPS plan. There are no resources dedicated to the workshop on recall effectiveness for Section 15B reporting. And I, I understand it's being run out of the chairman's office, but I think it's naive that staff will not be required at some point to join along the way. There are, these are important topics that deserve serious attention, not just check the box. Once again, there's no funding for an information and educational campaign for window cups. I know this is not a popular option for staff, and nor some of my fellow commissioners, and I understand um, in comments made that the chairman believes there's no, uh, that, that education campaigns are ineffective. But it seems there are some exceptions to that. Yet we don't hesitate in, to uh, assist an industry invest in designing these campaigns. It seems to me we should partner with, with industry and there could be some uh, real benefit derived that it, with a robust and sustained IME campaign that would advance the safety critical message uh, excuse me, a critical safety message on the importance of using cordless products to families and wherever children are present. I think we could have an effective IME campaign if we could get behind that um, in the agency. Another issue that uh, remains of concern to me is key senior staff positions remaining vacant, also troubling. We're putting forward a plan here that expands initiatives and takes on new ones while numerous of, uh, of of our directors have no permanent leadership. That's a void and it needs to be addressed and I do hope we will fill these uh, positions as soon as possible. In closing, um, and I do wanna thank my staff because they have been, um, Gib, Mullen, Nancy Lowry, and Caitlin Costello, they've been put at an extra disadvantage with my absence this week and how hard they've worked to, uh, to get all of the information to me in, in, uh, in our phone calls. So I do appreciate their work and I thank them. In closing, uh, while there were changes that if adopted that uh, would have made this plan more acceptable to me, um, my fellow commissioners have made it clear that they will not accept the necessary changes and thus offering them would have been an exercise in futility. Many of the amendments adopted here today give me even greater concern, including crib bumpers being treated as a durable, durable nursery product, the use of our resources um, to work on upholstered furniture flammability, in the end, this is a document that is much more reflective of the majority's policy and therefore not one that I can support as it takes this, down, this agency down a path that I don't believe is, is the appropriate role of government. I think the role of our agency is to protect consumers from unreasonable risk. It is not to use the threat of rulemaking and questionable compliance activities as a tool to bully industry into doing what we want or worse, to engage in activity that can be interpreted as an abuse of power. Our policy decisions and agency actions should address actual risks and should be driven by sound science and data. Thank you. Commissioner Marhova, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to associate myself with the thoughtful appreciation expressed by my colleagues for all the staff that contributed to this operating plan and, of course, uh, to this uh, decisional hearing today. I would like to recognize and thank my staff, Bryce Dustman, Mike Gentine, and Ryan Radford also for their late nights and tireless work on this effort. And Commissioner Burkle uh, alluded to it very briefly, but I'd like to reemphasize the appreciation for the regular timing with which this operating plan was delivered to the Commission, deliberated and considered. So special thanks to our Executive Director for that, uh, as well as to Commissioner Robinson for her uh, unending support for that kind of a process, and as well to the Chairman for agreeing to uh, put this in regular order. So uh, I very much hope that we see our operating plans at the same time frame. Uh, but I did vote uh, against the FY17 operating plan uh, for, uh, for several reasons. Um, the first point that I'd like to make is that uh, I, I shouldn't really be shocked to find that there's midnight regulations at the CPSC. Uh, for those that have visited my office, I have a not too subtle reminder uh, and warning that uh, by, by virtue of having Wilson Pickett's midnight, uh, midnight Hour album uh, at my entryway as a bit of a prediction that um, after two years of, uh, of saying we're not going to move on the voluntary recall rule and 6B rule, it looks like, lo and behold, uh, through this operating plan and through the expressed uh, desires of uh, the majority that we will move on those particular rules. Uh, so for two and a half years that I've been on the Commission, I've been voicing my concern that the proposed voluntary recall and 6B rules, which are among the most controversial proposals this agency has ever offered, would spring to life in the waning moments of this administration. I've been worried that just when our stakeholders had been lulled into thinking the rules were har harmlessly asleep, that these two regulatory snakes and the consumer product grass would pop up and bite. And my spidey sense started tingling first when our regulatory agenda came to us. And it went on to full burning when our hearing on that agenda revealed that my colleagues had been working on a plan for those rules and that they hoped to have wrapped up by right around the current administration's midnight hour. So when this operating plan came to us, contradicting the assurances we've given the public, contradicting what we've told Congress we were up to and doing, contradicting the budget request we made for the year, and even contradicting the advice of the most progressive chairman this agency has ever had, I still was hardly surprised. But there are two things in this plan that did surprise me. And worse, they, came, they just came up today, not as part of the staff package. So there will be, I predict, very big surprises to everyone outside of the agency. First, I was surprised by Chairman Kay's amendment to regulate crib bumpers as if they were a durable infant and toddler product under Section 104 of CPSIA. If crib bumpers are durable products, I don't know what wouldn't be. That surprises and frightens me. Now, I can't say that Chairman Kay's amendment represents midnight regulation. By putting it in the operating plan, he is giving everyone a loud and clear signal of just how expansive his view of Section 104 is. However, the fact that we can see it coming does not make it good policy, and it does not make it an appropriate use of the limited authority that, sec that, that section grants us. Now, second, I was surprised by Commissioner Adler's suggestion that we should divert public money into private pockets, do it without specific statutory authorization or congressional approval, and do it without any guidance or direction to staff. But I'm very pleased he was kind enough to take that suggestion, and at a minimum, we should see the entire plan and protocol staff believes is appropriate before we vote to send one dollar out of our very limited bank account. On that note, one thing that troubles me in this plan is that both before and after today's amendments, it devotes resources away from where I believe the agency should be. As anyone who is paying close, close attention to CPSC knows, this agency has an astonishing number of vacancies in senior, mission-critical leadership positions, including our Director of Import Surveillance, our Deputy General Counsel, our Deputy Executive Director, and our Director of Compliance. I suspect that even the wonderful organizations that could benefit from Commissioner Adler's idea would agree that filling and funding these mission-critical vacancies is a better way to protect consumers. 
Again, I have no doubt that we all have only the best of intentions in mind, but intentions aren't good enough. We need to hold ourselves accountable, not just for our intentions, but for our actions. So even without what has transpired today, I could not have supported this operating plan. It allocates resources in ways I do not believe are our best path towards greater consumer safety. I have no doubt that, armed with this plan, our staff will continue to do tremendous work. My concern is not with staff's ability to follow the direction of the commission, to follow the direction the commission gives. It's that I believe the commission is giving the wrong direction. In some cases, marching the agency straight towards failure. In closing, however, my greater concern remains with the full speed dash towards midnight regulation that this plan represents, particularly in the voluntary recall and 6B rules. We have heard for years that these lightning rod rules were not priorities and that we did not want to spring anything on our regulated community. Yet that is exactly what we are poised to do because of this document. Now I chose not to offer amendments to stop work on these rules or to withdraw them completely today out of respect for my colleagues and the public's time and because I've done so, pre done so previously and have failed and also because my, co my colleagues have made abundantly clear that they are wedded to these looming disasters. Even as recently as August 31st, they told the world that they wanted to see these rules finalized and in the near term. For a change in their desire to finalize these rules, the majority is in the minority. I respect that spirit of perseverance, but I cannot join in it. The term midnight regulations comes from a comparison to Cinderella, where the magic wears off at the stroke of midnight, and in this case, it's the inauguration of the next president. Midnight regulation has been rightly criticized as a departure from responsible government, an effort to achieve political victories at a time when there can be no political accountability in return. That's exactly why I have been warning us and the public about this possibility for years. Every time I've expressed my concerns, I was assured that such a move would, just, would be just not our style, but it seems styles change and so do minds. What does not change is our responsibility to exercise our powers appropriately. The power to make laws and regulate is the power to deprive people of not only their property, but their liberty. The most important aspect of the appropriate use of our power is assure, ensuring that the people can hold us politically accountable for our decisions, both directly and through their elected representatives in Congress. Midnight regulation is an abdication of our responsibility, and it is one I cannot and will not join in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to those joining in person for watching on the webcast. This concludes this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission.